Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, as well as the world's first internet radio station dedicated to startups and tech companies. If you haven't done already so, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and leave us a nice comment. I welcome a guest today. She is the CEO of Nanostruct. Hey, Henrietta, how you doing? Hi, thank you. I'm doing well. That is good to hear. So um, you are the CEO of a company which is usually included in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, if people ask you, how did you end up there? Can you tell us a little bit about you? Um, uh, what did you do? And um, for everybody, just a disclaimer, you do have a PhD in physics, so you're a very smart girl. And... Um, and um, I would be curious at first how your interest in physics started. Oh, I think I was always interested in physics. Actually, I was absolutely fascinated from uh, by by everything that had to do with space. So movies like Apollo 13, Apollo, Apollo 13 in English, and uh, stuff like that. So I loved that when I was a little child, and I started thinking about what do I have to study. What, what do I have to study to do this? Did you yes, watch Star, Star Wars, Wars Star or Star Trek? Trek? Actually, both. I'm one of the few people who do like both. <laughs> so, I, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Welcome to Geek Radio. <laughs> so, you, you decide to study physics. So, um, um, you studied physics and you went for a PhD. Can you explain to guys like me who only have a business degree what you actually did, or is it too far out to explain it to dumb monkeys like me? <laughs> I can try to explain it in a really easy way. So in my PhD thesis, I worked in solid state physics. So that has that's everything that has to do with, with things that are in a solid state, as the name says. And what I did was a certain spectroscopy method, which is called photoelectron spectroscopy. And what you can do with this is looking at the electronic properties of these materials. And so in the most easy way, um, this means distinguishing between a metal, an insulator or a semiconductor. That's the very easiest part. Um, of course, uh, there are much more intriguing properties concerning the electronic state of, of a material. And um, that's where the difficult physics starts. There are some yeah, say quantum properties of the electronic states, which I took a look at, which is the electron spin. Um, yeah, and basically there are some fascinating materials that have that have a very special spin property, intrinsic spin property, and this is what I was looking at. I think if I go deeper, it becomes too complex maybe for this. But the general thing that I did was looking at electronic states in solid materials and surfaces. Talking about spin in electrons, basically, mm -hmm. that's just a characteristic and nobody's sure if an electron is really turning any way, one way or another or something like this. It is just mm -hmm. um, an agreement be between physicists. Um, if it's behaving like this, it has a spin of X. If it's behaving like this, it has a spin of Y. So basically, we don't know which way the electrons are spinning, right? Exactly. It's not, not really a spinning movement. It's more an angular momentum, intrinsic angular momentum. So uh, you cannot, if you think of an electron which actually spins in one direction, this is, this is uh, not 100% correct. Um, so as you said, it's um, a quantum property where we don't really know whether the electron is spinning in one or the other direction, but where um, it describes certain behaviors, which which come with this angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And now all my physics teachers can die in peace. I learned something. 
Awesome. But um, let us drag on a little bit because um, you then stayed at the university as a postdoc and um, you also started a company, Nanostruct, working in nanostructures. Can you first tell us a little bit because the audience here is basically composed of people who are interested in startups. What did drive you? from a Star Trek and Star Wars geek, which we all really like, um, to become a, a founder? What, what, what was like the moment, oh, I want to do that? I think that's actually quite a long time that I, yeah, I was sure that I, I would love to do my own thing, start my own company. Yeah, this is just the way of working um, with setting my own goals, uh, organizing my projects, projects the way I want them to to work out and stuff like that. This is something I already did during my PhD. I had a lot of freedom to plan everything by myself and to basically also set goals by myself. So this is a way of working which yeah, which I definitely like and enjoy and where, where I function very well. And uh, so for me, it was during, let's say, at the end of my PhD thesis, it was already clear to me that at some point starting something for myself would be an option and would be something that I would like to do. The only thing that was missing was uh, creativity, <laughs> a very good idea, you know, the, the inventive mind, let's say it like this. Um, and fortunately, I have a very good friend, Anne Kraus, who is a very inventive person and who during his PhD is working with nanostructures and basically the optical properties of these nanostructures. And he realized that what he was doing is actually solving a problem in a certain spectroscopy method, different sp spectroscopy method than the one I did during my PhD thesis, but still from the principles, also spectroscopy again. And there, what he did is actually solving um, an issue. And that is when he started thinking about founding his own company. And since we are good friends, I, of course, heard about this. I talked to him about this and it didn't take a lot of convincing to, for me to, um, to join him. And yeah, now we are co-founders together with two other guys. And have this company for everybody who's who's uh who is just uh a little bit confused what spectroscopy is it's a study of mm -hmm. interaction between matter and el electromagnetic radiation as a function of the wavelengths or frequency or color of the radiation uh, for everybody who wants to know more they can go down here in the show notes there's an article on wikipedia from which i just read <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> sorry, <it's laughs> it was the only way I could find something out about this. So basically, we uh, yeah, but actually, actually, Wikipedia is a good place to look for a very principal explanation for many different physical things. So mostly, the things you find in Wikipedia are correct, and very often it's put in a very easy way that it's possible to understand. In some cases, it's also already very deep and difficult and maybe it's too much but especially spectroscopy in principle you will find a lot of information maybe from my side to explain a little bit what this spectroscopy method is which we are working with so basically what we are doing is uh, or, or, or how the spectroscopy method works is um, you have a material some substance and you shine laser light on the substance and because you do this the, um, the molecules inside the substance start to vibrate. For physicists, this means the electronic states change. <laughs> For non-physicists, you could uh, imagine it's, it's similar to a chord of a guitar. So you, if, you, if you hit the chord, it starts to vibrate and it makes a certain sound. So also this... Yeah, right, right. If the bell is bigger, the sound will change. If the chord of a guitar is longer, the sound will change. So also for this molecules, depending on, on the exact, what, exact properties, how many, so how, how the atoms in the molecules are bound to each other, stuff like this. Um, this changes basically the vibrational properties. And then when you um, look at the light that 
is basically coming back from the molecule. Then you have a, like a fingerprint of the molecules which are in the substance. So you can find out which material is in a certain substance by this type of spectroscopy. So this is basically how it works. I had to smile when you just explained this. I had an alternative title for our interview. Uh, meet nanostruct, they are listening to molecules. <laughs> mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, this is actually a very good way to put it. Awesome. Now we have the title. Great. Just love this interview. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, my understanding is that also uh, Fraunhofer, a German physicist, did this. And basically, he found that the, uh, that the molecules light is coming from uh, leave some traces. So the light has some traces of the molecules it comes from. So that's why how we can know uh, what are very, very distant stars are composed of basically you just easily said dissect the light with a prism, right? Exactly. Yeah. This is basically what you what you do. You the actually this is the light is prism is is, is exactly the right comparison. Um you're looking at the different colors of the light and that comes out of the molecule and by seeing at which colors the molecule shines, you know which what molecule it is. So this is also a very good comparison. Now my physics teacher can not only die in peace, they can die happy. That is really great. Um, let us now get into what you guys are actually doing in the company with this. Um, because when you look at your guys website, um, which is of course linked down here in the show notes, um, you see, you, you talk about precise reproducible nanostructures. Can, can we first get into like, what is a nanostructure? What is the problem now? And how you guys make it just awesome? So nanostructures, nano comes from nanometers. It's basically a size similar to meters, just smaller. Um, the general piece of paper, I would say, is about 100,000 nanometers thick. So now you can imagine how small nanometers are. And the structures that we do are basically small antennas. Um, these antennas have length of a few hundred of nanometers. And because they are so small, they function not for radio waves, um, which the antennas that you know from your car, from your cell phone, um, they, they function for radio waves, which have length of meters up to kilometers. But our antennas are incredibly small, though so they function for frequencies um, or for wavelengths, which are in the order of visible light. And this is basically the frequencies at which these molecules shine. And similar to radio waves on on the roof or on in the car, uh, the, the antennas on the roof or, or in the car, also the small antennas can um, emit and uh, can emit light and they can um, basically strengthen the thickness. So when you use this Raman spectroscopy and you look at the signal without the nanostructures, without out these antennas, then um, the signal will be very low. To get a strong signal, you use these antennas to enhance the signal, signal and there are enhancements possible yeah, up to up to million fold. So this is a very um, incredible enhancement of such signals and this is in general used in so-called surface enhanced spectroscopy. And the special thing about our nanostructures compared to other such nanostructure chips, let's call it, or let's call it uh, sensor chips for Raman spectroscopy, or in general, they are called SIR substrates. This is basically the, the, the common name for this product. Very often, this uh, product shows a very bad reproducibility. The problem is why this is the case um, is that the way the nanostructures are fabricated is very random. It's, for example, you, you use Co colloidal materials, so basically 
basically nanoparticles in a solution, you put them on the substrate and they randomly arrange and form a random nanostructure. In our case, what we are doing is we, determ we, we, we have deterministic nanostructures where we know from one of our product to the next that the structures that you find on the substrate are exactly the same. So we have a very high reproducible from one substrate to the next. This is important because if we again look at the enhancement that we get in the spectroscopy method, of course, it's not very helpful if you do one measurement, get one enhancement, do the next measurement and get completely different signal. So basically you want to be sure that you always get the same um, result in your measurements. This is, has something to do with uh, reliability of these substrates. In the end, it's basically that. So our substrates are our nanostructures on the substrates. These substrates are very reliable. Um, it it, and it this kind is, of reminds me basically, uh, it, it's like making a cake, right? You have the surface, you, you have the cake, and you uh, spread over something like a cream, cream cheese or something mm -hmm. over it. But you do it on a very tiny and very precise level. Is, is that exactly something exactly <gasps> oh yeah. I'm right. we have a very precise recipe and not only do it by very random shaking some flour inside to the cake and stuff like that but we have a very precise yeah structure for how to build this um this cake so it will taste the same every time <laughs> that is great and um what where are actually the applications of the structures you are working with? So applications are everywhere, first of all, where the spectroscopy method is already used and where a reliability is important. And this is, for example, in, um, in the chemical industry, in the biological industry. So Raman spectroscopy is very interesting for biological measurements because it, it works with water, which not every, every of these type of um, method does. So you can work with cells, for example. Um, so biological um, yeah, technologies, this is, this is where it's important. And everywhere where you want to know a certain, uh, whether a certain material is inside a substance, inside a sample, there Raman spectroscopy becomes interesting. Um, ph pharmaceutical products, this is also um, something where this becomes important. To give an example, you develop a new me medication and you want to know whether there are any um, uh, substances inside that might be um, harmful and you want to know this, so you can use the method. You want to know this reliably, so you need a very good source substrate. But this is where our substrate can be used, for example. So uh, if I understood it right, you enable better analytics and better machines, for example, for biology and pharmacy. For example, yes. There are actually many different applications. So any... Um, Anywhere where uh, it is important to know whether a certain substance is inside a material. Food industry is another example. So if you want to look for harmful substances inside food and you want to make sure um, there is uh, there's st uh, nothing inside, this is also a place where this method works and where you need a, a reliability and this is also where we can place our substrates. So I, I can think of many, many, many different, <laughs> different examples. So this is, yeah, it's a very um, strong method, actually. To buzz you a little bit here, uh, would it be possible to basically have a sensor, including your technology at the end of a production queue, for example, let's stick with cake, and you can make sure that there's no machine oil and there's no uh, metal parts in it? So in principle, yes. So the method could be so so usually you would have a, 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 um, basically the spectroscope which you would put at the end of such a production line for example and there you could for example run a, a liquid uh, 
yeah, I, I guess you would have to actually take a sample and put it on the substrate and do this part by hand. So the automatization is in principle possible, but not at our current status, I would say. <laughs> so another um, example which which we are actually thinking about is the um, development of certain medications. I think I, I mentioned it before, where the speed of the development process could be made much, much, much faster with when using Raman spectroscopy. So in numbers, uh, for example, I'm talking about biologica medi medication. Um, and these biologicals usually take a year to develop a new, um, new, new type. And uh, by using surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, you could shorten this by 75% and therefore also shorten the costs, of course, and also the costs are pretty high. And the problem is, is that the SIR substrates that are used are not reliable enough. This means this, the, the method itself cannot be used. And up to now, this was the problem. But now with our product, it becomes possible to actually have reliable enough um, measurements to actually reduce time and cost of such a medication um, development by 75%. So this is actually a very, very nice uh, example where our product can, can be of tremendous help. Um, another more, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, currently very interesting um, thing is, is of course, uh, detecting viruses. So this is also possible with Raman spectroscopy. And this is also something where you, you need a certain reliability to actually make sure that a test for virus or a antibody um, is, is correct. So this is also somewhere where we are looking at whether we can um, apply our substrates. That sounds pretty interesting. Getting a little bit away from the vi scary viruses into the more uh, other area, how you guys are currently financed, uh, how, how do you afford all your research, all the eventual production? And one more question. Are you guys actually going to like physically make production facilities or are you working with contractors and basically everything you guys are is a lot of smart people with a lot of high end computers in a room? So maybe your second question first. Uh, we're planning on doing basically everything in house. Uh, we have a, we have the, so the, 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 the very nice part about our product is that, um, the production itself is not very complex, um, and not very expensive. So this is quite nice and we can do it ourselves. We don't need a huge space for this. So this is something we can, keep by ourselves completely as at least for the let's say for the starting time um, concerning our funding we are currently funded by an exist um, transfer of research would be the english translation i would say this is a funding from the german state which basically funds uh, research projects that aim at develop developing a certain product and starting a company and in this funding Actually, the starting of a company is, is definitely um, the goal. So um, basically, there uh, is a second funding, uh, which we might get um, after this, this exist transfer of research finishes and uh, therefore we are funded by this until let's say middle of next year um, from that on we will need some external funding and we are actually currently starting to get in contact with investors mm -hmm. that sounds pretty interesting every investor who would like to know more they can go down here in the show notes and reach out to you guys there is of course the company website as well as your linkedin profile linked in there as well as some wikipedia articles for everybody who's like me and doesn't understand a lot but grasp the basic principles as you say it's good for the basic principles um henrietta it... don't be scared of physics 
It's actually much fun. <laughs> awesome, Cord. Love it. Um, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you here. Best of luck and hope to have you back in, in some time and actually do an update on you guys and how you're changing the world. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure was all mine. If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is StartupRad.io, the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English, but you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.io podcast or check for the StartupRad.io internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.io skill as well.